and uh, Craig, Josh, myself, Phil. It, is, <clears throat> is Diane on? Yes. Okay, hi Diane. Hi Diane. Hi Ron. Ron, I think we have what we're gonna have. Uh, okay. Uh, Diane, working on getting her computer feed going again, but I think we're ready to probably call it to the order. Okay, yeah, I just wasn't sure if the guy, camera guy here was gonna. We're all ready to go? Okay, all right, let's call the meeting to the order. The Resource Conservation Commission for the City of Fitchburg. The meeting is called to order at 638. Uh, first item on our agenda is to appoint a timekeeper. And we had uh, Gabriella on there, but she's un unfortunately she can't make it. So uh, Chris, do you want to do it for us? Sure. Okay, thank you. And do we have anyone here that's going to speak on non-agenda items? Okay, no one's here in the chambers that's to speak on non-agenda items. Uh, move on to the next item uh, on the agenda. It's approval of the minutes, draft minutes from June 9th, 2021. Uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to review those minutes and, and gotten comments back to Claudia. Uh, is there a motion to approve the draft minutes from June 9, 2021? I make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Um, I have one thing on eight on five B through the storm drain inlet mural design. Um, the sentence that starts with "unfortunately," I think there's a, I think there's a clause or something missing, and I suggest rewording that. Claudia, can you hear me? Okay. Is Claudia we on? We can hear you. Okay. Unfortunately, due to construction delays, the location where the mural was intended to be placed won't be ready until fall. So um, just, a, just a minor change in that sentence. What was the change, Diane? That's noted. Unfortunately, do you, do you see where that sentence goes? Yes. Then I suggest that it say, due to construction delays, comma, the location where the mural was intended to be placed won't be ready until fall. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor of approving the, the draft minutes from June 9, 2021, say aye. Aye. All those that oppose? No nay, so minutes are approved. Next on the agenda item is uh, the USGS Swan Creek Monitoring Station. Tonight with us we have Todd Stuntenbeck from the USGS, and he'll give us a little short presentation on the establishment of the new stream ga gauging station at Swan Creek. So Todd, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Hopefully, um, oh, I got to hit share here. And there we go. Can you see the screen all right? It should say USGS monitoring station on Swan Creek. Uh, yes. Yep. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks to Claudia for putting this together. This is just a, a short little uh, picture show of the station that uh, we installed uh, several weeks ago on Swan Creek. It was a truly a collaborative effort between a, a number of, of different entities. Um, the location is right on Lawler Road where Swan Creek crosses, just uh, a little bit west of the toe of Lake Wabisa. What we have there is a stream flow and water quality monitoring station. And these are some of the images of our, installa our final installation and then uh, some of the guys uh, putting the station in there. What we're uh, doing there is we're measuring stream flow and water quality. Those are the, the two big components of what we're doing. And so with our instrumentation there, we actually measure stream flow every 15 minutes and actually every five minutes during uh, storm flow events. And then uh, at the end of the year, we'll have a continuous flow or discharge record. And inside uh, this sampler that we have here, we actually have a refrigerated auto sampler in there. Periodically during storm flow events and sometimes during base flow events, 
or basal periods, I should say, we collect samples. And then we send those samples to the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene. And we have those samples run for phosphorus and total suspended solids. And some of the samples we also have analyzed for chloride, uh, for uh, dissolved phosphorus and nitrate nitrogen as well. So at the end of the year, what we do is we combine the stream flow data with the water quality data and we determine loads. So how many pounds of phosphorus were delivered on each day? How many tons of sediment were delivered each day? Um, in addition to the phosphorus and sediment continuous record that we have there, we also have uh, temperature going there. So we can see how temperature uh, fluctuates uh, over time. And then we also have a conductivity meter there. And what we're hoping to do is relate that conductivity to the chloride concentrations in the stream, develop a relationship there, and then have a continuous record of chloride through the entire uh, year and over time. So um, what can we do with these data? Well, uh, like anything else, uh, we can talk about and we can look at the current data and can compare it to what we see from some of our other sites. Uh, I do work for the USGS and I am in charge of the Dane County monitoring project for us. And with that project, we work with Dane County and a number of different entities uh, in Dane County. And we measure the lake levels, we measure stream flow at uh, uh, it's like about 16 different locations. And then we have auto samplers and we have water quality information at another dozen locations all within the O'Hara River watershed. Um, so we know we're the, we're the people that measure how much phosphorus gets into the lakes. And so we can compare what we're learning at Swan Creek. We can compare to what we've learned over long periods of time at these other stations as well. Uh, from a stream flow perspective, we can look at our stream peaks we can see, uh, uh, we can use that information to see how those peaks are changing over time. For example, as the uh, city of Fitchburg and the town of Duns uh, start to develop even more over time. We can look at low flow periods, which is another concern specifically for uh, the wetland downstream of our gauge. Uh, we can look at uh, the long-term trend in low flow periods, continuous seven day periods of low flow and see if that's changing over time. And that might indicate a decrease in precip it might uh, indicate an increase in uh, impervious area, or it might uh, indicate an increase in pumping uh, due to groundwater withdrawals. <clears throat> so those are some of the things we can look at from a stream flow perspective. Uh, from storm loads, from a loading perspective, we can figure out how many pounds of phosphorus make it uh, to the lake, down to the toe of Lake Wabisa, and are contributing to algal growth down there. We can look at the seasonality and the timing of when those loadings occur. And we can trace those in some cases back to the landscape to determine what the potential sources are. And once we know the sources, then we could potentially work on some solutions to decrease those loadings. Um, the real, all of the things working together uh, really give us a picture of how the stream is responding to the landscape right now. But the real strength of this monitoring station is keeping it long term. Uh, we're looking at trends in, in water quality data takes time. We need time to look at trends. And the reason for that is that there's so much year to year and season to season variability in the weather, it's difficult to tease out all of those weather effects into what, a, what we would consider to be a real trend in the data. So once we get 10 or more years of data, I would say we can really start to see, um, are there true trends in the data? Are our flows going up or are they going down? Are our loads increasing or decreasing? And so with that, I wanted to just share with you real quickly here, um, uh, do I have anything else here? Here's a picture of our ribbon cutting ceremony on June 23rd. Um, this was my very, I've been working for the USGS for over 30 years. This is my very first ribbon cutting. I was, I was very proud. <laughs> um, and there's a nice picture of us all at the end. And I showed this to uh, many of my coworkers and the only thing they wanted to know is if I got to keep the scissors. <laughs> so, you know, great disappointment uh, when Claudia had to take that back from me. <laughs> so... I'm going to share. I'm going to unshare, and then I'm going to reshare one more time here. I'm going to find this. So, 
all of our data, I'm hoping you can see a little map of Wisconsin. Okay, good. So if you type into a web search, USGS real-time Wisconsin, or USGS Wisconsin data, um, you come onto a page that looks like this. And this is our uh, National Water Information System, our web interface for all of the data that we share with the public. And um, this map here shows different colors, so you can get a real quick indication of uh, whether or not there's high flow, like in the black and the blue areas, or low flow. And when I say high or low flow, that's, con that's compared to our long-term record at all of those stations. And you can actually do this for all of the USGS and all of uh, the United States and look at uh, stream flow trends in over time. But what I wanna show you here is if you come into this real time table, and I'm gonna be going fast and what I'm gonna do is uh, share a link with you before I leave. And I type in Swan, Swan Creek at Lawler Road near Fitchburg. And if you come in like this, you're defaulted to look at only discharge and water level or gauge height. If you want to look at more things, you can click on this, and then you can increase the number of days like this. So you can see all of the different collaborators up here. You can see we have a camera, and you can see a video over time. That um, helps us from a data workup perspective, but it also you know, helps the community engage uh, with what's what's with what's happening out there in the stream and they can relate to it. Here's our water temperature data here. You can see that um, on the left side, the, uh, the primary y-axis is in Celsius. The secondary y-axis is in Fahrenheit. We can look at our precipitation. Um, for some reason, this particular location has received more rainfall over the last five weeks probably than most places around here, which is probably good news for the for the farmers out there. And then this is our discharge. So uh, we installed the site in the middle of May or so, and you can see the, the flow was decreasing over time here. That's when it was super dry. And then we see some peaks on there, and that's when the rain occurred. Anytime you see a red um, blotch on there, that's when we went out there and made a discharge measurement. And we use these measurements to determine uh, we basically have to make a stage to discharge relationship in order to have a continuous flow record. And then here's our raw water level or gauge height data. If you're interested in, so that's the, you can also look at the daily data by clicking up there and that the blue ribbon. Um, and so you can look at the max min mean of the daily water temperature, for example, or the daily precipitation or the daily max min mean of conductivity. Um, and then finally, if you wanted to look at the water quality data, um, you can click on field measurements. This is a little bit, uh, no, that's not the one I wanted there. I wanted field slash lab samples. And then I recognize that you're not gonna be able to, to do this. You might have to click around a little bit, but um, you'll probably have my email address if you have any questions. And, uh, we can look at all of the data here. And so this basically shows a table of all the samples that have been received. So up here, these are actually results for three different samples. And you can learn on top here what each of these uh, codes means. 530 is suspended solid, 631 is nitrate. So you can look up here, um, 530, the first sample was 53 milligrams per liter and the nitrate was 5.76. There are samples down here that don't have any results with them. Those are samples that we've collected, that we've processed, and that we've submitted to the lab, but we haven't received any results for yet. So uh, that was a very, very fast uh, run through of some of the things that you can see, not only with this particular site, but with nearly all of um, our USGS sites throughout the country, not just, um, not just for Wisconsin. So I'm gonna put in the chat, I'm going to put a link if you, want, if you so desire to, to pop over there and uh, you know, feel free to browse that 
station as well as other stations in the Dane County area, or if you have a canoeing location in the Kickapoo that you want to learn about, that's a really good place to, to go to find out about uh, stream, stream data. So that's what I have. We have time. I'd, I'd, I'd field a few questions as long as they're easy. Todd, I have a question, and I'm sorry if you covered this because I'm, I'm juggling a few things trying to get this audio to work, which isn't succeeding. But can you explain a little bit more um, about that discharge? Did you say you have to go out there manually and do something? Yep. So that's the, the kooky thing about Streamflow is we really can't go out there and measure that directly, continuously. There's no sensor that you can put out there that says, here's the flow in the stream right now. Now, there's some hydroacoustics that you can do that with, but this isn't, this doesn't fit well with that. So what we can measure continuously is the water level. So there's pressure sensor, there's, there's a pressure sensor that we have out there that sort of acts like your ear, like when you dive down to the bottom of a pool. So the more water that's over the top of that sensor, uh, the more the reading will go up. So we'll have a continuous record of water level, but then what we need to do is go out there periodically and measure a stream flow or a discharge. And then we record what the water level was when we made that discharge and we come up with call, what's called a rating curve. And then we apply that rating curve to every single water level point throughout the entire year. And that gives us a discharge point for every single point in the year. It's kind of a, a, a weird thing, but that's that's old timey. That goes way, 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 way back. Stream flow discharge relations. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Todd? Question. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I was just going to ask, what do you need to do to winterize uh, these monitoring stations? What what are the things, steps that you need to go through for that? Yeah, um, we really don't have anything out there right now that's that, that's sensitive. Uh, the biggest challenge is um, if, if we need to sample in the wintertime and it's really cold and our sample lines, uh, we run them underground. And typically what happens is right in between the stream and the stream bank interface, that's where it's, it's, there's a tendency for that sample line to freeze. So what we have is we have heat tape down there. So we'll have AC power at that site real soon, and that keeps the sample line from freezing. But typically in the middle of winter, we're not sampling anyway, at least not with our auto sampler. We'll go out there and we'll manually collect a sample during low flow periods. If it does happen, if we do get a significant amount of runoff or uh, like rainfall runoff or snow, snow melt runoff, we'll go out there beforehand, make sure the sample lines are cleared um, so that that, that that sampler pumps just fine. But other than that, there's not too much winter rising that we need to do. And how come so many of the <clears throat> circles across the state were unranked in terms of their flow for kind of historical comparison? I think the reason for that is that in order to have a rank, there needs to be a certain amount of information for it to, to go on. I don't know what that, maybe it needs to have 10 or more years of record, for example. So I, th I think that's the reason for that. Has, has there been a uh, across the state, has there been a decent uptick in monitoring stations in, in recent past? I would say no. We typically, we've had uh, somewhere around 200 to 250 different locations. Um, some of them are not streams. Some of them are like, um, in addition to the Dane County work, I do a lot of agricultural runoff stuff. And so I do have, a, I have a lot of edge of field sites out there, agricultural edge of field sites. And so those, even though they're in our list of the number of monitoring stations, they wouldn't show up as circles because they're not really, you know, long-term stream float type sites. But, um, and there's also groundwater wells in there. Some of our sites are meteorological stations only. Um, but I would say in general, our stream flow program is probably declining a little bit um, over time as, um, especially with, with COVID, uh, there were a lot of communities that had to make tough decisions with whether or not they wanted to continue to fund a USGS station. So uh, for the most part, though, I think people are kind of banding together and commingling dollars and finding ways to keep the long-term stations going. But I do know our long-term stream gauging program is down uh, a tick. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. Um, just from the USGS perspective, uh, what excites you about the addition of this new monitoring station? 
Yeah. Um, so one of the things is that <clears throat> I've given a, a few presentations at various locations over time, and um, Joy happened to be at one of them, and Steve Schooler was at one of them, and um, it was really impressed upon me how important the, the, the wetlands are there, and I was asked to be part of the uh, uh, what the wetlands commission i actually attended one of the one of their meetings but i had to bow out because uh, it just wasn't a long-term sustainable thing that i could do so having that information uh to kind of link the landscape to the water quality to you know the wetlands down there is something that i think is really going to be uh is going to make a lot of people happy and that's just and there's going to be uh, you know from from the city's perspective and from the township's perspective this information will not only help you know m make sure that those wetlands are protected, um, but it will also help, it, it can help uh, to make decisions on, on development. You know, are we making the right decisions? Are we putting things in places that are okay? Because if something, uh, if a big development goes in and we can see a significant change in what's going on in the water quality, um, then we can see the, you know, the action and the reaction. And then the city can learn from, from those experiences. So. To me, providing tangible science-based data to make water decisions, that's my job and that makes me excited. Thank you. Any other questions for Todd? Okay. Maybe just one more. Is, is this gonna be incorporated in the larger, or, or will this data be incorporated in the larger dredging efforts kind of along the chain that I know the county is undertaking over the next several years? I don't, I would be surprised if they, so you're asking whether or not they're probably going to dredge? Well, I know there's this long five-year plan to dredge many of the stretches along the Yahara River Basin and, yeah. and to, to increase like outflow and, and reduce the flooding problems that they've been having in the county. And so I'm just curious in terms of flow rate at a location yeah. along something like this, if, they, if that's going to be incorporated. No, this one definitely wouldn't be part of that. Um, they're 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 interested in getting water out of the lakes, so so they're going to be dredging all of the Hare River channels, um, you know, where there's constrictions. And right now, they're working from McFarland down to so from Wabisa down to Kaganza right now. So they have they built a huge settling basin, so their dredge is going to be pumping up water and sediment up into this this basin. They'll be having you know um, all of the the dredge tailings or spoils, whatever you call it, go into these giant bags and they become dewatered. And so, the, and then the bags get distributed somewhere. Um, so, um, and if you want to get a close up view of what's happening, you can come over to McFarland at Babcock Park there, right across the Highway 51 from Babcock Park. You can see where their operation base is, but Swan would definitely not be in that. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, well, thank you, Todd. Uh, we, really, we really appreciate uh, the, the efforts of USGS to get this uh, station established on Swan Creek. <clears throat> I think it will be a valuable tool for us to follow what's going on in the watershed, uh, you know, particularly with stormwater, as, uh, particularly when we have more development occurring in the watershed. So this will help us monitor not only the flow, but the water quality that's going into Wabisa wetlands and Lake Wabisa. So uh, thank you for the presentation tonight. And my pleasure. Okay, Thank you. thanks. Thank you. Next on the item, agenda item under new business is 4B. It's resolution R-127-21, uh, resolution to accept a change order to the Curry Court and Old Indian Trail study. Uh, in the chambers, we have three people who would like to provide uh, some testimony and uh, since it's the first time I'm doing this, I assume we'll go ahead and, and let them provide testimony at this time. They each have three minutes to provide uh, their testimony. So if you want to come up uh, to the seats up here. Uh, first person, Lewis. Ron? Yeah. Usually, I think we let the staff introduce the, the topic. Okay. All right. We'll let, we'll let uh, Claudia introduce the topic and then. Oh, okay. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Ron and Diane. Thanks, Diane. Um, so, so this is uh, the Curry Court study. Um, I can share my screen just to give a little bit of background here. Um, 
just in terms of location in the city, uh, here is City Hall here, McKee, Bagaw, and then if you go um, here just south of Irish Lane and uh, Syene, um, this is the Curry Court neighborhood right here, um, and what I'm calling the old Indian Trail neighborhood um, on the west of South Syene. So this is an area um, I'm sure you're familiar with because they have had um, both flooding issues and, um, and groundwater issues. Um, so continuously running sump pumps, um, as well as flooding. At the end of Curry Court, it's been flooding. Um, that's affected several, several buildings there. Um, and by that, I mean first floor flooding um, coming from surface water. Um, although many other people in the area have experienced um, basement flooding, groundwater flooding of, um, of, of basements. And, and so that has necessitated um, some pumps that run continuously, um, multiple sump pumps, backup sump pumps, backup generators. Um, some folks have experienced um, cracking in foundations, structural issues, that kind of thing. So obviously this is an area with a lot of concerns. Um, so uh, we, we had our first public information meeting, I believe it was in February this year. Um, and just to, just to get folks on, on board with what this study was and the purpose of the study, um, just broadly the purpose of the study is to find solutions to the problems that folks are um, experiencing in this area. Um, and so as part of that first public information meeting, we got um, feedback on um, uh, issues that people were seeing in this area, uh, location as well as uh, gravity of those issues. Um, and then we also got feedback on um, different types of alternatives that we were going to look at because this uh, part of the scope is we were gonna have them look at three alternatives. Um, in order to fix the issues in this area. Um, and so as part of that, uh, we received um, quite a bit of feedback that folks did not want us to take a look at a pump station. Um, I think people understand that that's going to be expensive, both the upfront cost and the long-term maintenance cost. Um, so that's something that we took out of, we were originally thinking that would be one of the alternatives that we would look at. Um, but we did take it out um, and looked at three other alternatives instead. Um, we got to the end of this study with our consultant and the unfortunate news was the three alternatives um, that we thought were the most feasible and most likely to provide um, improvements for this area, we did, did, we did not see significant improvements. Um, so, uh, you know, that's not a great thing to have to go back to folks and let them know. Um, so I asked uh, Bill, the director of public works, hey, you know, it's kind of the, uh, the nuclear option, but we, we know pumping would work. Is that, um, is that something we even want to look into? Because it's not popular with the neighborhood. And, you know, from the city's point of view, it, it's a very expensive option. It's not typical for stormwater to be pumped. Um, except in ex very extreme situations. Um, and, I, and he said, you know, that's really maybe a, a decision council should make. So, so that's the reason this resolution is going through to allow council to, to weigh in on this is, if this is something that we would even consider doing as a city. And um, if so, then, then we'll go ahead and look at the feasibility of it. And if not, we won't um, waste any money on a change order to look at that. Okay, so Claudia, this resolution uh, essentially is uh, provided to uh, to us so we can make a decision whether to uh, uh, carry this forward for council approval in terms of uh, only looking at an another alternative, which would be the pumping station. Correct. Correct. Okay, so it's not to put a pumping station out there. It's just to look to have the opportunity to look at that alternative. It's to change the scope of the existing feasibility study to include looking at okay. a station. So instead of three the alternatives, 
instead of three alternatives, it'll be four alternatives now. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah. So we have three uh, gentlemen in the audience, and we'll start with uh, Mark Jones. Please uh, state your name and your address. Mark Jones, 2266 South Syene Road, City of Fitchburg. Um, I farm the area immediately to the south of uh, the Curry Court neighborhood. Um, and Claudia and I had worked together quite a little bit early on in this study, uh, some history. And there's some things that concern me about the, um, well, there's several things that concern me. One, um, there's a limited area that's being proposed to be assessed, and the whole watershed should be assessed. If you're going to assess five of the watershed people and not the other 45, uh, that, that is not a good policy for the city to do, too. Um, the pumping station number five that would pump this um, discharge to Swan Creek, which would take the discharge to the north, where it meets, um, right on Syene Road, where it meets uh, the stormwater area uh, of Swan Creek, further, to, further down, just down from that, to the northwest, both of those houses have been flooded out in the past. Severely, Mr. Ewalt's property was flooded out, I think, at least three times, but once the whole house was flooded. Um, they've done some ditching to correct that. And the city does not own the easement uh, on the north side of um, Irish Lane, so that poses a big problem, too. And although they've been offered opportunities to maintain it, um, the city has never maintained it, so it's all grown up in terrible condition at this point in time. Discharging more water on there without looking at the whole thing, just a bad idea. Pumping is um, on pump number three, proposal number three, pumping that water to the south. Uh, there's other, there's better alternatives uh, through private property than taking along the road. Madison Gas is just uh, replacing a gas line along that. There's a high pressure gas line and a, and a low pressure gas line along Saint Ro Road to the south. They're being replaced, and we'd be putting a line right on top, right under it or on top of it. So uh, there's private property, uh, which I own, which we've offered to the city uh, to discharge into Murphy's Creek, which I don't see as part of this at all. So that puzzles me. Um, pumping is, is a bad choice. Uh, it costs a lot of money, a lot of maintenance. Um, I certainly don't recommend it. I'll work with the city whatever way I can to help my neighbors, but I like I like to work on smarter project, smarter smarter ways to solve problems than dumb ways to solve problems. So, um, pumping is just a bad choice, and then the area assess only a, or to assess a handful out of the whole area when everybody puts water into it is just a really poor idea. So okay, thank, thank you. you Mark. My name is Mike Connor, 2315 South Syene Road. I'm across the street from Curry Court. I'm the next to the lowest property before the water crosses under Syene Road to cause the Curry Court issue. Um, I pump almost every day, uh, most days, multiple times. Doesn't matter if there's a drought or not, I'm pumping. Um, they. Uh, I have had water problems for over 40 years. I had water problems when I moved in. I've tiled my basement. I've put in sump pumps. I had a sump pump, but I've replaced several of them. Um, I pump out into the ditch, and it crosses the road at the next, after the next driveway. And um, every direction from my house west all the way around to northeast is above me. Now, this is one item that hasn't been talked about again. Um, it's been brought up at every person that 
walks out along our road that's supposedly working on our water issue, um, we, could saw, we could save about 250 feet on each side of the road of flat drainage if they would put a culvert in from the center of Curry Court over to the south side of Curry Court, thereby eliminating a lot of the water that has to come through two neighbors, me and my lower neighbor. Um, I've not heard that solution either. Curry Court is, is, as a plumber, it's flat. There's less than six inches of drop in 500 feet. So it's, that's considered flat. Um, Mark has, has offered this up before, and I'm hoping the city will listen this time because um, if there was the chance of putting curb and gutter down on the end of Curry Court, not on the whole thing, just on the end, and force the water to the east slightly from Curry Court, it could be dug in, and, and my problem, not Louis, but my problem could partially go away because they could dig across the right by the tracks and take it south to Murphy's Creek through Mark's property. Now ours isn't the only what the groundwater problem isn't caused by that. Mine is that part is surface water. My groundwater problem is caused mostly by the place right behind Louie down on Old Indian Trail. There used to be a pond there. The city filled it in in 58 or 59, correct, Mark? Okay, somewhere's right in there. Ever since I've lived there, I've had groundwater problems. I have geysers. I put tile under my floor, and I still have geysers, two feet shooting out of the floor when we have groundwater issues, okay? There's, groundwater is an issue, but part of it is because there's ground, there's water sitting on the surface behind Louie's on city property. Okay, all right, thank you. Time? Yep. I am uh, Louis Smith. Uh, I live now on 5157 Old Indian Trail, right on the corner of South Sain Road and Old Indian. Uh, I used to live on the Curry Court uh, Street uh, in the apartments there back in 74. So I've been in the Fitchburg area for over 45 years. Anyway, um, my... Uh, concern about this is uh, being that I've been there this long, we never had these kind of water issues for decades. Uh, so something has happened to the topography of the land and the runoff. I know for a fact that at the end of Curry Court, uh, the water flow has been blocked off. Uh, it used to, you know, whatever time when we needed water flow, it flowed out. It never sat there like it does now. Um, so I don't know. I know from my, uh, on Old Indian and where uh, Mike was talking about the, the city property to the south and to the west of me, um, there's a ditch there. When they did fill in the pond, they left a ditch there, and the, and the water drained down to Murphy, down South Syene, and across to the marsh over by the Cherokee dog kennels. And that marsh will hold an awful lot of water, uh, and then it continues to flow on from that point uh, and eventually makes it to Wabisa and Kiganza and all those places. But... Those uh, that ditch has filled in, uh, silted in, and uh, the water no longer flows. So when we get heavy rains, it just that whole area becomes a marsh again, just fills up, and it flows. The water actually flows to the north now, and uh, fills up everybody's yards uh, with water. And I have to pump the water out of my backyard over to Syene Road, and then let it flow down uh, towards Curry Court because that's the only direction it'll go now because I can't pump it out of the other direction to the south where it should go. So uh, I don't know, uh, we've had many, many uh, uh, communications with Claudia and I don't know, she seems to be in favor of pumping um, as it seems to be the only alternative they think will work. Uh, I'm not in favor of that. I would rather than just leave it, leave it alone because I know it's just gonna be nothing but headaches and expenses, so. <clears throat> Thank you, Louis. Yep. Okay, so we've heard uh, an overview from Claudia and we've had testimony from uh, three people from in the chamber. Uh, the next item would be to make a motion to uh, approve or accept a change order to move it forward to council. Is there a motion? 
I guess I'll make that motion just for the purpose so that we can have some discussion. Exactly. Is there a second? A second for the same reason. Thank you, Chris. Uh, go ahead and open uh, item for discussion. Diane. Claudia, um, it, it sounds like, and I, I'm sure that you're much more familiar with this area than I am, but it sounds like a, a lot of Curry Court's issues are being caused upstream. So when, when these engineers evaluated this situation, I mean, if we solve the upstream, if we solve the upstream problem, I'm not sure why I'm hearing an echo. Hope you guys aren't. Um, if we solve the upstream problem, would that alleviate the Curry Court situation? So, so the idea is that I guess I heard um, Mark mentioned uh, piping to the south along his property, or uh, piping to the south along Syene, um, or reinstalling that pond, um, reditching within the uh, within the park. Um, I'm trying to think. Was there another one? I, I think I also heard adding adding an inlet somewhere at the end of Curry Court, um, and and piping that south. Um, I, I hope that's a fair representation of, of, of what those folks said there. Um, and, and those options have been looked into. Um, that, that was part of the study. Um, and we did not see significant improvement with those options. Um, so can you define that? So uh, the way that it was modeled was using what's called a rain on grid model. So we take the topography and then we um, apply a storm, a storm event to, to that topography. And then you can see the maximum flood elevations um, along the topography um, and, and where, where you're seeing um, flooding occurring and how long it's occurring. You can look at all of those things. Um, and so you can compare the do nothing alternative with actually changing the landscape to implement these, um, these options. And then you can see how flooding changes from before and after. Um, so it's a, it's a graphical representation of, um, of what would happen if we actually spent the money on these options. Um, so so that's, that's how that determination was made based on, based on modeling. But when you say it's not a significant um, improvement, what are you saying? Would it still bloody or just occasionally? So in terms of um, flood area, that area that's impacted by flooding and then also duration of flooding, um, those are kind of the two things that we would look at in order to make a determination on whether or not the alternative was effective. And you're saying that there would still be flooding? Correct. So there would be no significant improvement based on those alternatives. But would there be some improvement? Those options? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Would there be some improvement, combination Claudia? Of those options evaluated, or was it just individual options? So it was combinations of options that were looked at. Yeah. And and I did put in the staff. Oh, actually, maybe it's not in the staff packet, but we we are planning um, a public information meeting so that the consultant can go into more detail on all of that. And, um, you know, so I, I can give you a brief summary here, but at that public information meeting, we will be providing a, a very in-depth review of the study methods, the study alternatives that were looked at, and then the study results. Claudia, would that in-depth review uh, take in consideration the concerns uh, or the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the uh, thoughts of the testimony tonight in terms of what, how to fix the problem? Yes, those options were, were looked at, so, so it would. Okay. Also, uh, how were costs developed in terms of signing, uh, in terms of the assessment, assigning who would be paying what? Yeah, so I apologize for the, um, I guess, misunderstanding on, on that. 
Um, so, so probably the most likely thing that will provide some improvement in this area is having a sump pump collection system um, that would just allow people to plug into a, uh, a pipe within the right of way. And um, that would take water, you know, down to where it needs to drain basically. Um, and that would keep the ditches from being quite so wet all of the time. Um, so the, the areas where people would be able to, and actually that, that piece hasn't been assessed, assessed at this point, um, but I, want to, I wanted to make sure that if that is a feasible alternative that we are able to do it next year, because if we don't send out assessment letters, we can't do it next year, we would have to wait another year. Um, so I wanted to make sure even though that, that piece of it hasn't been thoroughly evaluated at this point, um, the, uh, the houses that, at least in my opinion, would likely be able to tie into a, a drainage system like what I described, um, similar to Lyman Lane and Florian Lane, um, I'm sure you're familiar with those projects, um, would, would get a notification letter and that we would be able to move forward with that project um, regardless of the other alternatives. And you know, I think the timeline of those has to wait um, but in terms of moving forward with, a, with that, I think that's a very likely option that we would want to move forward with. Um, the other thing that I think is a likely option for us to move forward with, and I'll share my screen one more time. So I believe the, um, that the places that were included um, for that sump pump collection system, I believe it was the houses on the north side of Curry Court and then houses on the south side of Curry Court. Um, I didn't include areas that would not have a sump pump. So if it's not developed land, um, then obviously there's no uh, benefit from that. So, so those lands wouldn't be assessed. Um, and then uh, parcel uh, of some parcels along Syene, um, I included in that notification letter in addition, there's an area here which previously based on um, information provided just by talking to residents, um, there's an area here that previously drained south and now that area has been um, filled in. And based on speaking to the um, owner of this, uh, of this parcel, sorry, let me back up. Um, so, so that was, that was all done. This whole area was platted prior to the city being a city. Um, and unfortunately, there was no public drainage easement provided in this area when, when this was platted out. Um, so we don't, we don't have the right to or ability to just go in easily to open this up. Um, and in speaking to the, uh, the owners of this parcel here, um, they would like compensation for any sort of new easement that would be provided. So, um, so the people, based on the uh, analysis that we did, uh, uh, putting a culvert here does not provide any sort of benefit to Curry Court downstream. Um, so really what that's going to do is only reduce the very localized flooding on either side of there's a, there's a pipe here. Um, and there's a little bit of localized flooding on either side of that pipe. So, so these four parcels were included in the uh, assessment notification for that reason. Um, so, so the assessment notification wasn't for everything. You know, we haven't even finalized or, or picked which options we want to move forward with, which bigger options. But those are the options that I think are most likely that we would want to move forward with and that we would most likely be able to do next year very easily. Um, and so I wanted to make sure those notification letters went out because procedurally, if they don't go out, we can't do it next year. It has to, it has to wait a year. Claudia, is the, is the primary objection um, to, from the neighbors to the pump station it's, it's primary objection, the cost of it? Yes, it's the cost um, and then uh, upfront cost and then long-term cost um, 
folks don't think it's a smart way for the city to spend money. Thanks, Claudia. Any other uh, uh, comments or discussion? Um, with that, I'd like to uh, take a vote on on moving this resolution to accept the change order to the Curry Court Indian Trail study. Uh, all in favor, say aye. You know, I'm, I think I'm going to vote for this because I think it's worth exploring. I don't think this commits the city to do it. And, you know, I think the council, when they make the decision, should have all the options available. Um, so that they can make a decision whether this is a something that they want to do or not do. Um, I, I'm I'm thinking the same way, Diane. I think we need to hear more from the public input in this to make sure that uh, we we consider their concerns and their ideas. So I'm I'm going to vote yes just to move this forward so we can get those concerns and and issues brought up before us uh, and before the engineering staff. I vote yes as well. Okay. Yes, for the same reasons. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia. The next item on the agenda item is, is uh, 4C, brainstorm topics for upcoming sustainability meeting, focus meeting. Uh, I assume that would be you, Phil. I think that would be make a lot of sense, yeah. <laughs> so we are uh, two months away from September, which will be the sustainability topic focused meeting after we use June for stormwater storm water focus. Um, and I have a, a, a couple of things I was thinking about, but just sort of wanted to uh, discuss with the RCC, same as same as we did in, I think, April for stormwater, just to kind of talk about what what we wanted to use that that meeting for when uh, you'll have you'll have me here, uh, but not Claudia. Um, I think the, the the thing that would make the most sense is I've been speaking more with uh, Gabriella about um, the push to try to come up with a a plan for developing what we've been calling a sustainability plan, whether it's going to be broadly sustainability or specific to energy and water, climate and water, like the, the clean energy resolution called for. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, keep putting in some more some more research on that before September, but I think that would be uh, a really good meeting to to just kind of talk about how uh, what you all think about that, what you'd like to see included, um, the, the the steps that, that need to be taken to get that to uh, just sort of to the next the next steps. Uh, was sort of the, the primary thing that I thought would make a lot of sense to include in that meeting. I think that's a good idea, Phil. Um, but I would like you to spend a little bit of time, um, just a quick review of what your job is now. I mean, I know that sounds kind of strange, but when, mm -hmm. before, you, before you were moved to um, the department that you're in now, I mean, most of the work that you did surrounded what RCC was involved in, and some of some of your work now is working with with other areas. So I think that it would be helpful for us to just get a feel for what you do. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that would be a good topic as well. That's been uh, um, uh, that has come up quite a bit in the last year. I think it would be. That'd be a really good discussion point. So just kind of reviewing the sustainability specialist role. I think uh, it would be good to just kind of take a step back and look, um, you know, just have some smaller brainstorming sessions, you know, maybe a couple of 10 minute sessions, you know, what are we doing really well as a community with sustainability? You know, how do we continue to enhance those aspects of sustainability within our community. And then uh, from the other angle, what are we not doing very well um, from a sustainability perspective? And, and, and then maybe some ideas around, you know, what can we do to improve those areas of, of weakness uh, with regards to sustainability in Fitchburg? 
and just just kind of you know get people's thoughts on that and just you know I just think get some ideas on the board and and just kind of see where those land and see if that helps us drive some of our strategy moving forward as a community. Okay. Um, one other thing that I had thought about, uh, if there's time and if y'all would be interested in it, I know I gave kind of a high level overview in, um, did I, I think, did I give an overview of the uh, internship with the UW grad students in May? Yes. Okay, um, I could dive a little bit more kind of into that talking about uh, talking about what our energy performance is like and kind of kind of uh, going through what what I'm thinking in terms of uh, making that energy information available, uh, kind of how how the reporting on that is looking. Um, it's usually more of a kind of end of year, start of the next year topic to sort of review the previous year's energy use and, and kind of go through reporting on that. Uh, I think it would be nice to, to keep a little, bit, little bit of momentum from that work with the interns. So, you know, certainly I'm going to be uh, spending time in the coming months working on, on that and trying to devise uh, some, some reporting ideas and, a, you know, hopefully a dashboard that will make uh, reporting a little bit easier and more user friendly. Um, kind of a question of whether that's something that at this point you'd be interested in seeing, or if we just kind of hold off on that until the, the normal end of year. I think I'd like to hear more about it in detail. Okay. Why don't we, maybe we should just hold that as a, if we have time, because sure. I, I think that could easily fit into one of our normal meetings too. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess one question is, you know, do we want to um, advertise a little bit for people, you know, we can do it through our green e news blast, but, you know, the opportunity for people to come and share what they'd like to see from a sustainability perspective in the community. Uh, if we want to have a kind of an open public segment or participation or engagement in the meeting, uh, that's a potential consideration um, just to kind of get some ideas outside of, you know, this group. Um, you know, Chris, we could lose real control over the meeting. I mean, I think that's a good idea to solicit that input, but um, maybe we could do that in a different, uh, different situation, different setting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's, I mean, I think it would be very tough to control in this setting. Yeah, and well, it yeah, it could it could you know if you get um, ten people show up to to speak, that's that's a pretty good chunk of the meeting. Yeah, um, but I, I like that idea. I mean, certainly, uh, that would be I think the kind of a thing that the COS would frequently discuss on how to get that kind of feedback and engagement. Uh, if there would be value in the larger RCC talking about that, that could be a topic is just talking about what's the best way to, um, you know, kind of kind of bring that COS topic into a full RCC meeting for September and, and talk about uh, different ideas for better engaging and, and soliciting that kind of feedback. Yeah, I, if we go back to kind of the whole process of trying to get a sustainability plan, I think the natural step was the process that we were following, correct, Diane, from yep. way back. And so you know, part of the first step of, you know, kind of building that sustainability plan is getting the public input mm -hmm. and finding a way to, to get that. And, you know, it was more so going to be kind of handpicked people that represented different parts of the community when we did that uh, and then build the sustainability plan based on kind of all their perspectives and feedback that they provide at those meetings. Um, you know, I still think that that's a piece of it, um, but I, you know, I do agree that this probably is not the format for it. And we can talk about maybe ways to capture or collect some of that feedback uh, from the community. Thanks, Phil. Any other comments?
Okay, next item on the agenda is item uh, 4D. Uh, we're going to hear from the Tree Preservation Ordinance. Uh, Gabriella was going to introduce this, but she's not here today. So we have uh, Linda and Craig from the Preservation Group here to talk about uh, this uh, preservation ordinance, Tree Preservation Ordinance. So who wants to go first, Linda, you or Craig? Craig is going to um, represent us tonight. Okay. And thank you. Yeah, Craig. I'll Craig introduce that. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm uh, coming back to video here so that I can. Oh, I guess so all of you can see me. Okay. Yeah, uh, wrapped up that last item faster than I expected. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm here to talk about, well, I'm very dark. I apologize for that. Um, the Tree Advisory Committee has been working on a uh, developing a tree uh, protection ordinance. Uh, and Gabriella sits on that committee as well, which is why uh, she, she suggested we bring this to, to you guys tonight. Um, and I'll give you a quick background and then kind of kind of give the ask for what we're looking for tonight. Um, we are working on this for a few reasons. Um, the, the first is that just as a as a committee. Our goal is to try and preserve uh, trees here, tree diversity and heritage trees in Fitchburg. So uh, we, we feel as a committee that one of the best ways we can do that is actually to, to potentially move forward and give the um, forester a little bit more power and authority in, in trying to keep some of these heritage trees. So that's kind of the, the primary goal. Um, the second reason we're, we're really working on this is that uh, as part of the um, five-year comprehensive plan this year this past um, version of it and five years ago the previous version of that there's been a um, long-standing goal in there for our committee to develop a tree preservation ordinance uh, which has been something um, because the committee was founded kind of towards that first plan um, it hasn't really taken off much yet, but now we've we've gotten our feet under us and we're really um, ready to focus on that goal now. And uh, the the final idea here is that um, we we are seeking certification as a um, I'm going to forget the name of it. It's a uh, certified tree city, I believe. Um, and Linda can correct me on that later. But um, the idea behind that is that um, it cities across the country can check a number of boxes and then they get certified as a tree city and then that helps in writing grant proposals and also getting funding from various things and it can be used as a as a marketing thing but one of the requirements there is to have a a tree protection ordinance kind of on the books in that in the town so those are our three reasons i'm sorry i'm uh talking uh, a lot but i want you guys to know the background um, Today, uh, I think it was part of your packet, we have kind of some goals, scope, and definitions that were sent your way. Mm -hmm. What we are looking for is feedback. Um, we've, we've spent quite a lot of time bouncing around ideas within our committee, but we really want to get input from other groups, other areas, um, so that we know if there's anything big we're missing, if there's any ideas in there that, that people think are um, need, need improvement, and to get the idea in front of you now so that over time we can potentially um, you know, work with you and other, other committees to try and bring this up to the, to the council as a whole. So um, that was a whole lot, but the idea is uh, <laughs> we're, we're looking for feedback. So uh, if anybody has conversation items or feedback they want to provide, we are happy to hear it. I have a couple got a question. questions. If oh, sorry, you go ahead. to entertain those. Um, in your draft, um, can you, you talk about a land division. Is that the same thing as development? Uh, yes. So our, the, the primary target of this would be new development and trying to keep um, trying to, to make a plan between the developers and the forester to hopefully prevent the loss of some of the old growth trees. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, just a suggestion. You might want to maybe parenthetically note that land division and development are sort of synonymous. Um, the other thing is just a verb tense. When you're talking about commemorative t trees, everything else in your draft is, is present tense, and that's past tense. So I, I would suggest saying commemorative, commemorative trees are planted as a living tribute instead of were planted. Um, and my last comment, um, in section 5478 of the city's um, parks and recreation and forestry, uh, that gives the city city forester the authority to remove trees that are pri um, on private property that are a public nuisance if they interfere with, are infected with pest or disease or endanger the life. You know, I mean, you can read the rest of that section. Um, I would like you to somehow underscore that because I reported maybe five years ago um, uh, an ash tree that was infected with emerald ash bore and on private property and I reported that to the city forester thinking that she could address that um, with the property owner and she said that, that that was not within her authority to do that and and I pointed out this section to her but apparently um, there's some some confusion as to what her authority might be so I mean if you're if you're presenting this to the council maybe clarify that because in my opinion that clearly says she's got the authority to do something about a situation like that. Uh, uh, absolutely, I'm happy to bring that back to her. Could you repeat just one more time the, the section? I missed that at the very beginning and I wanna make sure I've got the full It's section 54.78. Perfect. I think it's in your minutes from the March meeting. I will uh, bring that up. It, it, probably fits as a separate discussion agenda item, but I'm happy to, to bring that back and have that conversation with the committee. I, I, by, and by the way, um, I should have prefaced everything with this. Is, I think this you, you've done a very nice job on this draft. Very, very, very long overdue. I remember um, working with Ed Bartell on this shortly after I moved to Fitchburg, and that's been almost 20 years ago. So. Um, good job to finally move this forward. Oh, thank you. I'm curious if there could be, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm curious if there could be um, maybe some reference to like private education or private outreach, like, you know, building either materials or, or some level of communication to give to, you know, homeowners in the Fitchburg area who maybe have one of these trees on their property to kind of alert, you know, emphasize the importance of trees like that on one end, and then maybe on the other end, materials for, you know, selecting trees for, you know, your your region or for, you know, we, we talk about native species on here, which I think is great, but as a homeowner with a ton of trees on, on my property, I, I want to see more people get involved and want to plant trees on their property. So I think this is wonderful, and I'm, and I'm going to support the city in any way I can to, to do this on public land, but, you know, the vast majority, there's a huge opportunity in private land too. And I think there's a lot of homeowners who maybe find this a little intimidating. And so um, I think yet yeah, trees are pretty resilient, right? And so I think outreach efforts or education efforts in this space could be really effective just to get people either comfortable or starting to dive into kind of how to make a selection or, mm -hmm. or what resources are, are available to them to help in this space. Um, I think just a general kind of theme of that kind of could touch on a lot of the great uh, efforts and, and, and emphasis that you have highlighted here. <clears throat> Josh, can I piggyback on what you said? Um, <coughs> that reminds me, and this gets, gets to the tree diversity uh, event that we had, I think it was last Thursday. Um, it used to be with, with oak wilt that it was safe to um, do something with oak trees, trim them or, or whatever, um, from October 15th until April 15th and with the climate change, um, that, that apparently has changed. And I remember Anna said um, they, they wait until November now. And I think that it would be good for, um, if you can get some space on the city's website, certainly um, some space in the star, um, reminding people that they should not be pruning oak trees or cutting them down or anything like that um, 
I think, I, I, you know, you can get guidelines from Anna, but it sounds like from November, you can do it between November and maybe early March, and after that, um, leave them alone. <clears throat> So I think the, out, the educational outreach is a really, those are all really good initiatives for the Tree Advisory Committee. And thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Good recommendations. Thanks, Ann. Hey, Craig and Linda, I have a couple of, just a couple of questions on your goals. Uh, one of the first ones says provide for planting trees to mitigate tree loss during land division or road development projects. Uh, I hope your, your goal would be to make sure that the trees that were lost would be replaced by, I guess, more tree, trees that have functional values instead of just planting something out there that was out there existing, which may have been an invasive tree species or something like that. You're not going to replace an invasive tree species with another invasive tree species. We'd like to, to have more diversity in the types of trees that are planted or repl for replacement uh, in those areas. Um, also, uh, and again, the same thing, to reduce tree loss during development, you know, if it's an invasive species that was taken out, I don't, I don't think there'd be a lot of people that would be concerned about that, but hopefully replacing it with, uh, you know, a more native types of tree species that's for our area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the city's budget for tree planting is, is pretty slim and- Yeah, $10,000 um, I, I found out. <laughs> yeah, and Anna is very um, discreet about what she chooses and it is all about sustainability and, um, Yep, and tree canopy and mm -hmm. so. But I, Great. I do think um, just updating that first goal to, to be more explicit about that might be helpful because um, absolutely the, the idea here is not to keep you know, the, the invasive species just for the sake of older trees. Um, the, the idea would be to have open that conversation with Anna so that she can really fight for the, the native um, mm -hmm. diversity here rather than just you know, keeping trees for the for the sake of them if they're not necessarily a uh, a good fit for the area. So, um, I will make sure to keep that note in the the goal okay. so that we're very clear about that. As someone new to the committee, I'll feign ignorance on this one. Does is there um, are trees incorporated in the erosion control plan for Fitchburg? Uh, no. So the erosion control plan is specifically how you're going to keep soil from moving during construction. So, so that's not, that's not part of it. So we don't have like a long-term erosion control in the waterways where we could be looking at tree, you know, targeted tree planting to help maintain stream banks or anything like that? Uh, stream banks, no, we don't have an ordinance on stream banks. Um, we do have a stormwater management ordinance um, that's looking more at water quality and water water quantity. Um, and trees are not typically a way to achieve those goals. Um, and I, I can't speak for Anna, but I know that she does keep in mind the the stormwater um, areas when when they're determining city plantings, but. Um, you'd have to, to get much more detail on that from her because mm -hmm. she's the expert on that one, so. Okay, we're kind of uh, getting behind here, so I wanna keep moving forward. Uh, thanks, Greg okay. and Linda. Um, and if anybody has any um, follow-up questions, please feel free to, to yes. reach out. Um, happy to, to field more, and I That's really awesome. appreciate you all taking the time uh, tonight to, to give us this great feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Hey, we, we do have a member from the public who would like to make a comment on the trees. <clears throat> Mark Jones, 2266 South Syene Road, City of Fitchburg. Um, two things. Um, in a lot of the committees and this committee also, it's referred to, um, we refer to the city webpage. Please remember that the people in the rural areas don't have access to the city webpage. Mm -hmm. um, there's limited access uh, to in the rural area. The tree ordinances are a great thing and we've, uh, heritage oaks, for example, I know are, are uh, something that 
the city has for a long time um, been interested in preserving. They kind of forgot to tell the assessing department that because in the reassessment they did to the rural areas this last year, if you have a wooded parcel under a certain acreage, my wooded parcel, which has heritage oaks in it, is under five acres. It does not qualify for any programs to reduce the taxes. And the city assessor raised the taxes on that wooded area as a recreational, because it's recreationally wooded and it's under the uh, five acreage for the program. And there's no relief to get away from paying higher taxes. The assessing department told me I sh to, or, to reduce my taxes, suggested I cut my heritage oaks and the other things down, that I remove oh. the trees from that area and make it cropland. That's your assessing department, your assessor. That is what they said to me. So when we, it's a little, a little yeah. puzzling to me to, we need to get everybody on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, if we're, uh, one department is telling you to cut the trees down, other department is telling you you want to preserve them. I want to preserve my five acres, but I certainly don't want to pay recreational taxes on that five acres. And that is what our assessing department did to me. My taxes went up 4,000 bucks last year. 4,000 bucks one year, last year. And when we tried to look at it to try to reduce some of it, that is one of the things they told me to do, cut the trees down, plant corn. Really? Is that the way you want your city to operate? I hope not. So we, there's, there needs to be some larger discussion on that. But please, include the rural area, because some of the farm areas have some beautiful trees. Um, mm -hmm. Don't forget about the rural people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right, next on the agenda, uh, I had something added to the agenda, and hopefully to keep on, I, I guess, on future agenda is a potential new business items, things that we want to talk about in the future to have discussions or if we have, want to have people give presentations regarding specific activities, you know, like the Tree Preservation Committee or some things like that. So I just wanted to have that item on there uh, to bring up potential things commissioners might have that they would like to see discussed uh, at our meetings. Uh, one, one thing that I was approached by uh, is the Upper Sugar River Watershed uh, Management Association. Uh, they would like to come in and give a presentation on the grant they just received uh, from Wisconsin DNR regarding uh, uh, invasive species and how to control them. Uh, right now they're trying to develop a partnership with a lot of the different entities in, in the area, uh, including Dane County, including outside of Dane County, and, and look in, in, in private groups and nonprofit groups. So they want to give a presentation on their program to explain how uh, we all can do a better job of, I guess, controlling invasive species in our area. So I just wanted to get a, a thought from the commissioners to see if they would, if they would like to hear them in August at the next meeting. I think that sounds really interesting, Ron, um, and I would like to hear from them, but depending on what else is on the agenda for August, maybe, maybe a later meeting when, when we have more avail more time available. I don't know what you have pending for August. Yeah, I'm just looking at the agenda. Plastic bag reduction event, fall cleanup event discussions, discuss progress on renewable outreach and programs for Fitchburg. Begin planning for Green Thursday fall event. I mean, if looking at the next month, September, October, and November, uh, they're all pretty filled up. And August is probably would be the best month of the next four remaining months that we would have time for them. They would do probably like maybe a, a five to 10 minute presentation. Well, just, just a heads up, um, whenever we have a guest it's never five or 10 minutes. It's usually at minimum half hour, you know, when we, with questions and things, usually 45 minutes. 
Okay. Well, I think it's an important topic, the controlling evasive species uh, in our area. I mean, when you're out hiking and you look at all these different evasive plants moving in, taking over, you know, area of the native plants, if, if we can find ways to help control them, uh, and they are getting funding to identify uh, measures and, you know, educational programs to do that, I think it would, might be good for us to listen to them. I think it fits in Buddy, with our... do you think that we'll be in person in August? I don't know. I, um, I, I mean, I guess we have the opportunity now to be in person. Yeah, I I'm thought we sure could be in person now. Required. Sorry, what was that? I, I don't. I don't think the council chambers is all that conducive to discussion. Sure. Um, I. I really don't know until those policies are emailed out. I don't get a heads up on that. Okay, any other potential new business items that anyone wants to bring up? Ron, this isn't new business, and I emailed this about this to you already, so I don't, I don't mean to be badgering about it, but I really would like to um, have some more discussion on how we can get refuse and recycling information out to um, people who've, who buy existing homes in Fitchburg. Okay. No, I think it's a good item we have to, to cover. And I just wanted, I just wanted to throw it out there, Ron, just for your um, consideration, because these meetings are really, really full. Um, I, I think if people have new business items, they can also just email it to you. And then as the chair, you, you can decide what, um, what goes on the agenda. Um, it's also, valuable to see how other people feel about those agenda items, but that's something you could just make a, an executive decision on too, if, if you wanted to. Okay. Well, I'm learning this process, so. Yeah. yeah. And Ron, just to make myself available, you know, if you want, you know, since the past previous chair is no longer on the commission and I was the chair prior to that, if you'd like to just bounce some ideas okay. off me in terms of agenda, feel free to do that via email or a quick phone call. Happy to talk those things over with you. Um, as a timekeeper tonight, we're about 20 minutes uh, over right now, but I do see opportunities for us to make up time just because I don't think that we'll need to talk about Fitchburg Star articles for 15 minutes and then we won't have the council update with Gabrielle being gone. So I've been kind of letting it slide a little bit and let our conversations roll. Um, but <laughs> just to add that in there. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next agenda item, old business, uh, item 5A, RCC's request for 2022 operating budget. Uh, Claudia, do you have some comment on that? Um, yeah, and I can pull up the page in the packet where we have that information. Sorry. I had something else pulled up because I, I was incorrect about what came next. Um, does someone know what page that's on? I'm trying to find it. Oh, here it is. Um, so I'll just share my screen with um, Where did, what, what we had did discussed you find last that? time. Uh, so this includes the waterway cleanup supplies and appreciation gifts for $400. Um, I think last time I had recommended cutting that to 200 and then we had the discussion of having the gloves as the, uh, as the gift. Um, so I think we'll just keep it at 400, which is what we had requested in the past, um, just to make sure we have the funds available and then we can reassess in the future if we need all 400 for that. Um, Battery recycling, 2,500, we were planning to keep that so we could use that at our um, recycling day events. Um, speakers and film, films, 150, and then we were discussing moving that to the sustainability portion of the budget, as well as food and supplies. 
both of those to be moved to sustainability just so we can have more flexibility on what we use those funds for if we want to do um, something on trees or something you know right now that lives i believe in the refuse and recycling budget so i think it would make more sense in sustainability um and that was it so those were the rcc requests um did anyone else have any updates or comments on that looks good to me i don't have anything I, that's what i recall yeah Okay, um, I, I actually had a, had a question for folks um, and, and this came up kind of recently, so I haven't, I haven't been able to do a whole lot of research on it. Um, my knee jerk reaction is that it's not great necessarily, um, but I wanted to get thoughts from other folks in the commission. So um, one request that I've heard recently and then it occurred to me I've heard this more in the past as well um, is to do something about mosquitoes. Um, some folks have requested that we do some sort of treatment of mosquitoes. Apparently there are pellets or things that you can throw into the water that kill the larva. Um, so that's one request um, that I've heard and then another request has been installing aeration systems on these ponds. Um, just there are certain times of year where there's quite a bit of algae. Um, really the ponds are designed to, or at least the constructed ponds are designed to hold nutrients and clean the water before releasing them to um, waterways. So, so if there's algae in the ponds, that kind of means it's doing its job because it's holding on to nutrients. Um, but of course, um, a side effect of that is algae. Um, and sometimes, um, I guess it doesn't smell great. Um, so, so folks have um, requested aeration um, and then also potentially um, some sort of mosquito treatment. Um, I don't know if that, if anyone has any sort of reaction to if that's something we would want to look into. We have quite a lot of ponds in the city and, you know, it sounds expensive to me. It's not something that we've done in the past, but that doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Um, anyway, just feedback from anyone on, the, on those ideas mm -hmm. or those requests. Claudia, I, I think that if people are upset about the algae in the ponds, they should consider using, they could, should consider evaluating how much fertilizer they're putting on their lawn. Um, and if people think that the city should be putting aeration in their in the stormwater ponds, maybe they want to look at how many ta what they're paying for taxes right now, um, and what that would do to increase it. And finally, as far as killing mosquito larvae, other things eat the mosquitoes, um, and I'm not big on adding anything to the water. Yeah, I agree with Diane. I mean, there's better ways to control mosquitoes than introducing. If you're out there killing mosquito larvae, you're going to be killing other larvae from aquatic insects on there. So, and they're they're a food base for a lot of other critters that live in these ponds. So, you're just going to multiply or biomagnify any potential toxic chemicals in those animals. So, I mean, there are fish out there or minnows out there that can be stocked, but whether they're native, I think they, well, they have to be native that would eat mosquito larvae. So it's something that you might want to, might something that we, we could potentially look at. But again, it's You're just, yeah, I don't agree. I, I, on this. Maybe the intern could write an article explaining what the situation is and what the solutions are. Yeah. Right, and one, one of the things that I, I let folks know, especially about algae, is that, you know, what we could try is a, like a targeted public outreach effort to the watershed going to your pond, maybe direct mailings, you know, that kind of thing. And um, folks aren't having it. So, uh, you know, and really that is, that would be an answer if, if people can reduce the amount of nutrients they're putting on their lawns, then, then that's going to impact the pond that's right next door. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I just I, I just thought I'd mention that because that's something I've heard a little bit of buzz on um, this year. I'm not sure that it's something I would request in the budget, um, 
but I just wanted to get your feedback on that. One thing to add to that, Claudia. Um, so in the past, it's been probably, I don't know, seven to 10 years ago, um, but we did do a building a bat house event here in Fitchburg. Uh, and it was actually wildly popular. Uh, we had an expert come out from the DNR and then we actually had a building session and, um, you know, we had over 50 people at, you know, I believe it was uh, McKee Park is where we held it. Uh, yep. We gave away Dairy Queen Dealey Bars uh, to the attendees and uh, it was a really fun event and, you know, it's been a long time since we've done that, but, you know, building more bad houses is a good natural way as well. I've, I see a couple of them around in a couple different spots, but it would be nice to have, you know, a, another, you know, couple dozen bad houses out in the community uh, in proximity to these ponds as a potential way to help with mosquitoes as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are other things for birds as well, for swallows and, and flycatchers. I mean, I noticed at the burn pond there, there are some swallow nesting structures that were put up, and they actually, swallows were nesting in them this year. So there's a lot of other different ways, too. Sounds like an article, everybody. Yep. <laughs> I've already got my right, two thank in. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there's no limit. <laughs> Okay, any more discussion on that? So we can move on to the next agenda item, which is 5B, the assessment policy, a continuation of what uh, Claudia was explaining last time regarding the, uh, the stormwater assessment policy. And let me share my screen again. This is what I had pulled up last time. So uh, one sec here. Okay, here it is. Um, so I'll fly through a couple of these slides just because we did cover this last time, but these are these are the assessment methods just as a quick, very quick recap. Um, one is based on the front footage of the lot, um, sidewalk and curb and gutter use that method. Um, the area method is based on the area of the lot. Um, for example, a drainage project might um, use the area method. The lot or connection method um, would have each lot paying the same amount, um, regardless of how large the lot is because they're getting one connection. Um, so for example, a water or a sanitary connection might use this assessment method, um, the benefit zone. Um, and this is, uh, Typically, there's no formula for this, but you would consider different factors. So you might consider diff distance from the facility, utilization of the property to be assessed, and then the size of the property to, assess to be assessed might be um, factors that you consider when you come up with a formula for the benefit zone um, assessment method. And then the preferred method of assessment is um, shown here, and this is straight from our assessment policy. Um, so you can see curb and gutter, the, the most common is the front foot method. Um, for storm sewer, the most common is um, front area method. Let's see, water and sanitary, the most common are the lot method, um, just as examples there. Um, so upcoming projects, and I'm just going to review all of these because I think we might have done Florian and Lime and Lane last time. Um, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to install a sump pump collection system and then each um, house will be able to um, connect into that system. So, so we would do the piece in the right of way and then they would have to, at their own discretion and at their own expense, um, connect their sump pump into that system. Um, and so the proposal was the connection or lot method. So it would be regardless of the size of the lot or the frontage. Um, and then uh, the assessment would be 50% assessed to the homeowners there. And then 50% would be covered by the stormwater utility. Um, and then the rationale is explained there. So each lot will le likely connect one sump pump um, to the storm sewer, regardless of size, and then recommend 50% assessment 
because public infrastructure will also benefit um, from the private sumps um, in that we will have to do less, uh, put down less salt in the winter. Our roads won't become um, corroded quite so quickly, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the rationale for the 50-50 and also using the connection slash odd method there. Hey, Claudia. Can you just uh, explain to me how, how are the people, how do you determine which people will be assessed? When I, when I look at so, that map. Yeah, so this is just a, a schematic of where the, um, where the pipe would go. So if they're going to be given a connection to this pipe, then they would be assessed. And that would be, that would be regardless of if they're planning to connect to it right away, um, just having the opportunity to connect, they would be assessed. If, if I, I just another question, if the issue mm -hmm. is being caused outside as a result of things outside of that area, are people in the in those areas outside assessed? No. So this is one um, that's caused by high groundwater. Um, so, you know, that's, that's really just, I guess, <laughs> uh, high groundwater, you, it's not like a watershed where you necessarily know exactly where the water is coming from because it rolls downhill and, you know, you can, you can delineate the watershed. Um, with groundwater, it's, it, it's not the, it, it's definitely not the same area as the watershed, it might be similar. Um, but it's something you wouldn't be able to pin down without doing a, a, a watershed study, really. Um, and it might be, yeah. So, so that wouldn't that wouldn't really be taken into consideration. Uh, I, to me, it just seems like that area would be subject to high groundwater for all those homes, just not the ones that are in front of the they have the red line in front of them. So the ones on the other side, I'm not sure if you can see that there's a purple line on the other side. Um, so those those folks already have um, the ability to connect to a pipe. Um, so we just added, we're adding infrastructure to the other side of the street um, in areas where we've observed um, an issue that needs to be addressed. Okay. So that, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this one? Okay, so the next one was Lake Barney. Um, and as part of the study, uh, they simulated groundwater drawdown um, for this area. So they actually completed a groundwater study for, for this specific one. Um, so if we did a... Um, an outlet structure, these are the areas that would um, have up to one, this is one foot lower, the, the groundwater table would be lowered by one foot based on the selected alternative in this area, and then by two feet in this area, and then by three feet in these smaller areas here. Um, so the proposed um, assessment method would be the benefit zone because people are getting different benefit depending on how far they are from the improvement. Because um, you can see some people are having their groundwater lowered much more than others. Um, so uh, the, the proposed method would be the, ben the benefit zone um, based on distance from well, based on this map, really, <laughs> of um, who has been um, modeled to receive a benefit. Um, and the assessment would be 50% of the design and construction costs would be assessed to the uh, properties identified as benefiting. And then 50% um, would be picked up by the stormwater utility. The um, the rationale there is really just that this is going to be a very expensive project if council decides to go forward with this project. Um, and it's really not feasible to have that amount <laughs> assessed to people. So that was kind of the rationale for the 50-50 split, even though for this one, there, there is not, in my opinion, a perceived um, 
public benefit for this. Other questions on this one? Okay. Um, so Curry Court and Old Indian Trail, um, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, so the idea here is um, to install a sump pump discharge collection system. The exact location of the collection system hasn't been determined. Um, that's still something our, um, our consultant needs to look at, um, but I would imagine it would look something like a pipe on this side, pipe on this side, potentially a pipe coming over here to pick up um, sump pumps from these lots as well. Um, so again, it would be the same as the floor and alignment lane. Um, the city would pick up 50% of the construction costs and then 50% would be assessed to the, um, to the properties in this area. Um, and then I made a uh, comment that I did not include these specific properties because there's no um, homes. These are this this over here is actually a shed, so that's that area would not get have a sump pump. And then these are obviously undeveloped parcels, so there would be no no sump pump to connect to the drainage system. Um, so so that's why those were left out. Um, but it would be the same. Um, uh, same method as what, what I had discussed at Florian and Lyman Lane for that one. Cla Claudia, is that, when you're saying um, uh, would likely connect to one sump pump, are we talking about the same pumping station that we talked about earlier with Curry Court? Is that the same idea? No, so a sump pump is um, a private pump that, so that a person would purchase themselves and then install in their basement. Um, to keep so, their basement dry. Are, is, are there storm sewers in Curry Court? No. They are, it's ditched on either side, or actually just so on the this, side. This solution, this um, idea mm -hmm. is one of the ones that is not, would not appreciably improve the situation at Curry Court. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? So, so, so just to clarify, this would not appreciably um, improve the situation with, with stormwater runoff. Um, so that's like flash flooding. Um, but this, it, this would help um, keep the ditches quite as dry and potentially reduce recirculation of groundwater. Um, so, okay. so this is, there are two separate issues. One is the flash flooding issue and then the other one is the kind of groundwater issue. So this one's more getting at the groundwater issue. But if there's no storm sewer there, if you put in a storm sewer, wouldn't that help with the flash flooding? No, so um, it, it would not. Um, right now they have open ditches. So if you put a pipe instead of an open ditch, it's actually going to have less capacity than the, than the ditch. Um, but, but the idea with work. this is to allow the water to get into a pipe and it would be a small pipe and it wouldn't, it wouldn't even accept rainwater. Um, but the idea is you would keep the ditches dry um, if you allowed people to put their sump pump into a pipe rather than into the ditch, which would, you know, a lot of folks here think there's recirculation and I think that's probably true um, because you just have constantly wet ditches, you know, you. You, you empty your basement to not that far from your house and it kind of just sits there. Um, so that's the idea with this one. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if I did a good job explaining so, that. I'm sorry, I know this is a little bit off of this topic, but um, if you had a, doesn't a storm sewer take the, the rainwater somewhere else? So if you had a storm sewer there, wouldn't that, uh, I know it's going into a ditch now, but if it went into a storm sewer, wouldn't that take it somewhere else? So um, I guess I'm not fully understanding it would, where would you take it? Like the same place that the ditch is taking it or I, I'm not understanding like Well, you know, like, like neighborhoods that have storm sewers, where, do, where does the storm sewer take their water? Um, 
Well, a lot of times it takes it to a pond. Um, so where are the ditches taking the water currently from this area? So the ditches currently flow to the east. So it flows to the east here, um, and then eventually it goes under the railroad tracks um, here. So if you had a pipe instead of a ditch, you would just take it to the same direction. Um, unless you wanted to collect it somewhere and pipe, pump it, you might be able to, you know, reroute it this way and then pump it a different direction or, you know, I guess it's kind of a specific question. If, um, if I'm not doing a good job explaining it, Diane, maybe, maybe we can. Maybe we'll chat talk. about it later. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So Claude, you said there were no sewer lines in this area. They would have to be installed. Um, so, so this, I guess I'm not sure that I would call it a, a storm sewer. This would be a sump pump collection system. It's similar because they're pipes, but it's not a storm sewer. It's a sump pump collection system. Okay. Where would it take the water from the sump pump collection? Same place that it goes now. Which is down those culverts across under the railroad tracks, like you just described? Right, exactly. But the benefit would be that your ditches would be dry and you would have less recirculation. And you would also not have um, nuisance areas that are wet all of the time. Because the pipe would, would be at a lower lower in the ground or do a better job of, of transporting that water underneath the railway into into the other side is the justification. Well, it would it would go the same place, just in a pipe rather than in the ditch. So the the pipe is impervious, so it doesn't let water get out of the pipe. So you wouldn't it wouldn't be seeping in the whole way that it travels. Versus if it's in a ditch, it's able to seep into the ground the whole way. If that makes sense. Yeah, I guess what I'm asking is, to me, if there's water standing in the ditch, then part of the problem here is, to me, also feels like a change in topography. And if there's enough, you know, slope, basically, to allow those ditches to drain, do you feel like the slope on the pipe would be better? I mean, there's not going to be a point where the pipe is going to fill and it's going to back up into the sump pumps of the houses, correct? No. I think you're challenged with high groundwater, so you can put as much slope on the pipe, correct, Claudia? It's also a very flat area. So the pipe would likely be um, a similar pitch to the ditch. Yeah. Uh, the way that we would get cover is we would kind of offset it from the ditch. So um, for example, uh, can I get a... If you have your ditch here, say this is the ditch, right? You would put the pipe over here. So it might be even at the same elevation as the ditch. It just won't be in the ditch. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, sorry. <laughs> um, and there's really not a whole lot of like um, grade here. There's not a lot of pitch. So I doubt we could get that pipe to be much deeper at all than the actual ditch itself. It would just have to be next to the ditch so it's not an exposed pipe. Yeah, and I appreciate your drawing, Claudia. I think that kind of shows part of the challenge, you know, about piping versus ditching. I mean, ditching you have, you know, generally have a little bit more capacity because it's not a closed pipe. Right, exactly. And, you know, it's certainly a challenge, you know, and it's, I see how it's not an easy solution. Does any, I, I apologize if I didn't do a good job explaining that, but does anyone have any other questions on that? <laughs> no, thanks, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, hopefully, hopefully we got some clarity there. Um, if not, come to the public meeting. <laughs> we'll go into much more detail and, and have more time for questions. Um, and then, so this was the other piece of it, uh, we were proposing to um, put a storm sewer on this property here that would require um, purchasing an easement here. Um, I think there are two options. One might be trying to 
pursue legal options to, to get water, to, to get access to this area. Um, because technically you're really not supposed to uh, um, block a drainage way and have it negatively impact other people. But um, yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like when you're thinking path of least resistance and path of least cost to the city, it might just make most sense to just purchase an e easement there rather than trying to go a legal route. Um, so the idea here is to get a, an easement and then put a storm sewer and allow water to flow south as it did before um, to reduce the ponding that's occurring on either side of the culverts there. Um, and then uh, the thought here was that um, the people who are really going to benefit from this because we did not see any appreciable benefit um, downstream in Curry Court from doing this are really just these properties here who currently kind of have a nuisance condition, which is um, a small area of standing water, which um, obviously doesn't, doesn't look great. It doesn't smell great. Um, it's just not a good situation. Um, so the assessment would be the connection or lot method for those four um, properties um, with 100% of the costs assessed, which would include easement acquisition and construction costs. And then, so <laughs> this is one that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't even decided if this is something that we're going to move forward with, um, is if we were to install a pump station here, um, then I think here is where we would do the um, area method applied to the watershed that drains to the pump station. So we would look at the watershed that would drain there and then assess to those properties based on the area method of the lot. Um, and then the assessment would be 50% of the design and construction costs and then the feasibility study would not be assessed. Um, at least in part because when you do the feasibility study, you don't know what options you're going to pick or who's going to benefit or anything like that. So that's really the feasibility study is entirely picked up by the stormwater utility. Um, so, so that is that one. And I'm not even sure if this is worth discussion because I, I think there's a lot of opposition to this so we can kind of move forward. Um, uh, Fitcherona Road, reduced flooding on Fitcherona Road. Um, the proposed assessment method is no, no assessment. Um, the rationale is that the main benefit here is a public benefit um, by reducing flooding within the city's right of way. So that really is, in my mind, something that the um, stormwater utility should cover. Because um, to me, it's 100% public benefit. Flooding north of Duns Marsh, um, reduce the flooding north of Duns Marsh. Um, I would propose no assessment for that. Um, and the rationale is that the flooding um, within the city's right of way will be greatly improved. Um, so, so that is, and I guess the other thing is um, the main watershed draining to that is in the city of Madison. And we, we couldn't assess the city of Madison if we wanted to, but that's kind of, I guess a moot point, I, I think since it's, um, since the improvement is for, for flooding in the right of way um, and most of the improvements would be in the right of way, um, to, to me, that's something the stormwater utility should cover. Um, so no assessment for that one. And that's what I had um, on the assessment policy. Well, Claudia, before people get into questions, I just want to say that we're almost 25 minutes behind with 25 minutes remaining. So um, I would ask if we want to end on time to keep questions brief or follow up with Claudia directly after the meeting. I just want to mention that I think you've been um, very generous uh, during these assessments. So I hope that residents appreciate that. Okay, let's thank, thanks, Chris. We need to move on. Uh, thanks, Claudia. Uh, Diane uh, Fitchburg Star Articles, Item 5C on the agenda. 
Anything updates you know, on that? Since we have a new member, I wanted to explain a little more about our star, star article. So I'm not sure, Chris, that I might, I'll try to keep this under 15 minutes, but I'm, I'm going to into a little bit more detail than you probably expected. Um, Joshua, we commit, or Josh, we commit to writing a certain number of articles for the STAR every year. Um, and then certain members, any member of the RCC that, who wants to write an article or articles, um, writes an article. We commit to which month we're going to write the article, and the articles need to be between 500 and 700, or they should be between 500 and 700 pages long. They need to be from a persuasive um, perspective. Um, that's a requirement of the STAR. The STAR is nice enough to print these articles at no cost to us. Um, uh, we need to get them done and into the, the editor, Jim Feroli at the STAR, um, no later than the first Friday of every month. Of, of the month we want it to be published. And usually we try to get it to him earlier. He um, often has edits. Um, you know, it's his newspaper, and he, he knows the format that works better for readers. So um, don't take any edits that he makes personally. And just, I mean, he's, he's, we, we have, I have some guidelines that I can forward to you that Jim wrote, and I've got some, you know, other other tips on articles, but I just wanted to let you know that that's what, that's what we do. Um, some members aren't comfortable writing articles, and that's fine. We just take that into account when we make our commitment for the year. So um, that's a brief, that's a brief, very brief update on the STAR articles. Hopefully you've read some of ours who, that have been in the STAR. Um, and if you've got any questions, maybe you and I can chat um, outside of the meeting and keep this as short as Chris would like me to keep this short. Um, we have one article up for August, and that was written by Ron, and then we need an, oh, I'm sorry, that's July. July, and yeah. Then, and then we don't have anything in the docket. So I was thinking, Phil, I commented to you on the last um, Green E-Blast that part of that would, would make a nice article, and I still think that that would make a nice article um, for the start. It might need a little bit of tweaking, but I'd, I'd like to pursue that. Um, I have a you were referring to the recycling topic, right? Um, I don't have that e-blast, but it was the last e-blast that you sent out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and I do think that we need to hit recycling a little bit harder. I know that if we don't, if our recycling ratio isn't high enough, that um, if we have too many contaminations, our, our cost from Pelletier is going to go up. Um, and apparently they can assess some sort of a, an additional cost to us. So I think that would be a good article. I've got one that I'm working on, but it won't be, I don't think it's going to be ready for August. So anybody who has a topic that they would like to write on, and, um, you know, Josh, if you've got some, some ideas, just, just throw it out. It, need, it should be sustainability related, um, but that can cover just about anything. That's a, that's a pretty big umbrella. Um, so that's, that's what we have, but when we meet in in August, we're going to need some some ideas for future articles. Okay. Thanks, Diane. Done. <laughs> oh, I mean, we do need somebody to write for the artist August article yet, right? We don't have that assigned. You yeah. said we, we, is Ron we on deck for July or August? July. He's on deck for for July. Yeah, I've got July. Okay. So and we then, do need so, August. Um, we don't. We could use. Um, the, that section of Phil's, you know, as sort of a standby if we need it. If some, if you yeah. want to write something for August, Chris, that would be great. Um, uh, so, just let me know what you think. Yeah, let me look at what Phil, what you're thinking of for Phil. But I think you know something on the recycling contamination could be good. It could go along with the the master recycler program that's going on, mm -hmm. you know, right now and. Um, you know, and there's, and we're doing bigger things in the community in re, in regards to better recycling. Uh, and I expect some of those things to become more public this fall. The, the master recycler has been part of it, but there's bigger things that are, are coming. So Bucky Badger on recycling is, is coming to you in the near future. Oh, good. So, good. Diane, the, I, one, uh, the one Diana had mentioned was uh, one page in that last green e-news blast was on the, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, or kind of a, a new 
conceptualization of that as, as seven R is kind of breaking down that flow into more steps. Uh, definitely something I could adapt for the star if, um, if needed, yeah. Okay. Maybe Phil and Diane and I could just have a side conversation on that and decide Sounds kind of our good. direction. Sounds good. Thanks. Diane, I could do something in November around when we start getting uh, cold temperatures on salt reduction. I don't know if one been, has been done yet, but re reducing or the, the amount of salt that homeowners put on their property. Uh, we, we have done that recently. Um, okay. I think maybe not last winter, but the winter before, which doesn't mean we couldn't do it again. It's just um, Jim, Jim would insist on a different spin to it than I can send you the article that was, was done last time because I think I wrote it. Um, but he, he doesn't like to repeat things. And, and his version of recently is like three or four years. So I, I do think that we should hit the, start, the salt again. Um, so let me send you what I have. And, okay, let me see, um, if you, okay, let me see if I can okay. put a different spin on it. Okay, good. I think okay. that's a good one. You know, the other topic is maybe energy efficiency. I'm trying to look back. I don't yep. know if that we've had a really good energy efficiency article on what people didn't, can do to rise their home to try to save costs over the winter. Chris, months. didn't you just write one this last spring on efficiency? No, I, I wrote it on cardboard. Yeah. Oh, I thought either you were. Oh, okay, all right. I don't I thought know. we had an efficiency one in the last year, but maybe I'm misremembering. I'm just not. Well, another article that I'm thinking about is another is an article on um, fuel efficiency, making doing things to um, increase your fuel efficiency, especially with gas prices higher and energy prices higher. Um, we've done that, but we haven't done that for maybe four or five years. So there are a couple couple things. Couple ideas that I think we can finish off the year with. Do we have like a, an archived list of past topics, and then um, maybe a, a potential? I mean, I, I uh, to respond. Thanks for the overview. Um, I was going to ask somebody about this regardless, so I appreciate it. Um, I nothing specifically comes to mind, and I'd love to look through an archive to make sure that I'm not touching on the same stuff. Um, but I'd be more than happy to contribute to this. It's you know writing like this is stuff I've done in the past, so I'm definitely uh, interested. We don't, we don't have an archive. Um, we have my brain, um, <laughs> and I've got, to, to, the, to the extent that I've gotten articles, usually I, I request that people copy me when they send the article into the STAR so that I know that, that it's been done. Um, and we, I, I, I shortcutted this, but we tend when we have time, we circulate it to our other RCC members for feedback before we send it into the STAR. So to the extent that I've gotten um, final versions, I, I've, I've kept my own library on that, and I can kind of tell you what we've done in the past recently. I don't know if you went on the STAR's website. I'm not sure how far back you could go to find articles, but if you've got some ideas, um, I can let you know if that's something that we've, we've done recently. Okay? Okay. All right. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to item six on agenda, the council update. Uh, Gabrielle is not here, but she did send me a few words that she wanted me to read out. <coughs> so, excuse me, so I'll read them. Uh, her council update, uh, capital improvement plan update. There were presentations by department heads of the finance committee on June 14th. We talked briefly about each project and department heads answered questions. The meeting is available online. Second bullet, alders might have submitted amendments and they will be released on public on July 19th. There will be amendments related to stormwater and sustainability. Third bullet, there will be a public hearing on the CIP at the beginning of the council meeting on July 27th. Following this, alders will vote on the amendments and adopt the amended CIP, which is the capital improvement program. Next bullet, Chad Brecklin starts his position as a new city administrator on July 12th. An interim police chief has been appointed and the hiring process for the new chief police is underway. A survey is available online for residents to weigh in on what they would like to see in the new police chief. Um, I actually went on and did survey. It's a real short survey, so I, I encourage people to go on there and give your feedback. So that's uh, Gabriella's council update. Where where is the survey? It's on it's on the website, city's website. 
the home page? Uh, I think that's where it's at, yes. Okay. It popped up when I clicked on the, the website, so I'm not sure exactly where, but it, it came up. Okay, I, next on the item, uh, item seven, staff and commissioner updates. Uh, Claudia, you wanna give us an update on the solid waste? Uh, yes. Um, so just as a reminder, the fall recycling event has been set for Saturday, November 6th from 8 to 11 a.m. Um, we also have upcoming in the star, we took out an ad to let folks know about that upcoming event and what they can do to um, recycle their electronics and their um, confidential paperwork in the meantime, if they'd like to get rid of it um, sooner rather than later. So that is forthcoming. Um, also, just, uh, just something to get on your radar. We received a complaint about constantly overflowing recycling bins at the New Fountains apartment. Um, so that's something we have been monitoring um, for, actually it came up over the winter and then we, we made sure that they had uh, recycling bins installed. And then we heard again that the recycling bins are there but they're not being emptied. Um, frequently enough. So um, one thing that's happened very recently is they actually terminated their contract with their um, previous contractor, which I believe was Badgerland, and now they've switched to a new contractor. Um, they said that they, uh, for whatever reason, at least what we were told is that their previous contractor was not picking up according to their schedule. Um, so uh, we are uh, monitoring that to make sure that uh, that the switch does improve the situation, um, and we've been reporting to the DNR on that. Claudia, why is DNR involved? Uh, so DNR, there are state laws um, that uh, multifamily um, facilities are required to provide um, recycling. Um, so actually they're involved because the complaint went to DNR. So if the complaint went to us, then we would, um, we would follow up on that on our own in the same manner. But um, since the complaint went to DNR, we're just keeping them informed of the progress. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, that is their jurisdiction as well. We're the, we're the responsible unit to make sure that um, that uh, legislation gets carried out, but, but they have authority as well. So okay. uh, to, mm -hmm. And then, um, I'll, I'll move directly on to the stormwater update. Um, ribbon cutting ceremony for the USGS monitoring station June 23rd, as we discussed earlier. There's a, a link there to a YouTube video of the ceremony. Um, we are conducting inspections of all of the ponds this year to determine maintenance needs and discuss vegetation management goals. So that's something um, we have been uh, doing uh, the new street sweeper has arrived and it looks great. Um, we're going to have a small award ceremony um, with the winner of that contest on July 14 at 3.30 p.m. in front of City Hall. Um, if any RCC commissioners would like to attend um, and lend support to that, uh, uh, to that winner, um, I think it's really an awesome gift that she has given to the um, city by sharing her artwork with us uh, to display on our street sweeper and it looks fantastic. So I'm um, excited about that. Um, Claudia, before, before you move on, the last time that we talked about this, we suggested maybe some kind of a gift certificate um, to thank them. So did you pursue that? Yeah, so I did look into that, um, and that was something finance. Um, they had some hesitations. They don't want us to get into the um, habit of purchasing gift cards. That's not something that is um, encouraged, uh, but for this specific application, she said it was fine. So that's something that we can do. Good, good, thank, thank you. you. Um, and then let's see, we developed a trifold bright brochure, just talking about general guidance on approaches um, to address basement flooding concerns. Um, hard copies are available in the city lobby, and then it's also available on the uh, on the, on our website at the link provided. Um, New boundary signs have been purchased are, and are being placed in areas where encroachment issues have been observed. 
Um, staff conducted maintenance on the Renaissance rain garden to remove accumulated sediment. Um, four truckloads of sediment were removed and installed an under drain at the same time. And then we conducted some maintenance on the Renaissance pond and infiltr infiltration basin to reduce and even out the slopes to make that easier to access and maintain. Um, I just have a couple photos here in the um, in the packet of what that looks like. So these bottom photos are the Renaissance rain garden. So this had a lot of, acu uh, of sediment that had accumulated there. So we uh, went in and had that all removed. And then after uh, removing all of that sediment and installing an under drain, we, uh, we had Field and Stream go and restore the area and seed it. And then up here, is the Renaissance Pond and Infiltration Basin. What we had found was some of these side slopes were really too steep to get a mower back there or do any sort of meaningful maintenance. Um, so we just had um, someone go out, one of our crew go out and even out those slopes and, and really just make it um, better for equipment and also better if, if there are folks from the neighborhood who just want to walk around this area. Um, so that looked great. I don't have the finished product, but this was also um, seeded and matted as well. Claudia, where is that? Where is Renaissance Pond? So this is north of Dunn's Marsh. Um, in that, okay. uh, there's a, there are habitat for humanity homes there. Um, I want to say, I'll just show you real quick. So here's Dun, uh, Dunn's Marshes over here. And then the pond, uh, the the little rain garden is actually right We're here. Not We're not seeing your screen. screen. Oh, sorry about that. I, I shared the application <laughs> and not my entire screen. Here we go. Let's try this again. Uh, so here's Dunn's Marsh. And then, oh, it's sometimes slow. I won't do that. Um, over here at the intersection of Renaissance Drive and Crescent, uh, Crescent Road, right here is where that small rain garden is located. Um, and then the pond and infiltration area um, are in this parcel over here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that was all I had. Thanks, Claudia. Phil? Yep, uh, for a sustainability update. Um, didn't get a chance to share this in June, uh, but city staff led a sustainability bike tour around parts of West and Northwest Fitchburg on Saturday, May 23rd, uh, with about 20 to 25 participants in attendance from around the community. Uh, it was, um, the mayor was there. Uh, we had Chad Cole recording this all from Fact TV. Uh, also Tony there with Bike Fitchburg. Um, we had uh, Andy Potts there with the bike committee. So a nice, nice city representation. Um, and then, yeah, Fact TV was recording this. I'm waiting to hear when the, uh, I, I should probably check back in with Fact TV to see when the plan are, plan is to have this fully edited and made available online. Uh, once that's done, I'll, I'll be able to share it with you. Uh, but that was a really fun event. Went to five or six different events and just talked about, or five or six different spots around the city and um, talked about some of Fitchburg's sustainability efforts. Got a really good reception. Um, Planning is continuing for the North Fish Hatchery Road Hub. Uh, Wade Thompson and I recently submitted a couple grants for that. Uh, the one that I worked on was to help with design and construction costs for uh, the bike playground that we're planning for phase one uh, via grant from Dane County Parks, if that comes through. Um, and then the O'Brien Solar Fields, as you've heard by now, are fully operational as of early last month. Uh, with the addition of the 500 kilowatts of capacity that, uh, that that we're uh, contracted purchasing energy from, the percent of electricity that uh, is being met by renewables for the city of Fitchburg is roughly 40%. Now we're approaching 40% um, by the end of this year. It won't show up in the end of year totals just because January through May, we don't have that. Um, but you know, if you look at you know for the month of July, it should be about 40% of our uh, municipal electricity being met from re renewables. So we are past our goal of 25% by 2025, uh, over four years early, which is great. All right. Now on to all the other goals that we've set for ourselves. Um, if you've been keeping up with the Fitchburg Star, they've also carried a couple of articles in this project. The most recent one was just published online last week. 
Um, so feel free to go check those out and just note if you read that. Um, I think I maybe wasn't clear enough when I was uh, uh, chatting with the the uh, writer, but our purchased amount is 500 kilowatts of capacity, not not uh, 750, which is I think what was what was recorded. Um, but yeah, 500 kilowatts of capacity. We should be generating, uh, purchasing close to a million kilowatt hours uh, per year from that, which is pretty pretty exciting. Phil, can do you, will you have time, and will mg e allow it now for us to tour it? Um, right. So that's the other thing. There is going to be a um, mg e is holding an open house event on Tuesday, July 27th. I believe their intent was to send an email out to all of the commissioners, all the RCC members, and invite you to this. Um, I'll check back in with John and make sure that's still the case. But yeah, there's, there is going to be an open house on Tuesday, the 27th, uh, from four to six. Um, and hopefully you'll hear about that soon. Um, I, depending on how things go, what their appetite is for, for doing tours like that. Um, you know, certainly if, if everyone isn't able to make it to, to that open house, then I may, uh, reach back out to, to John and, and ask, sorry, my, uh, one of my mg &E contacts and just see what their appetite is for, for doing another tour with RCC. You know, at this point, once it's been open to the public, I would hope that they'd be comfortable doing that tour and having say fact TV along to record it, you know, or we yeah. could announce it just, just to make sure that we're, we're good with open meetings things. But, um, yeah, that once that open house has happened, I think that that'll kind of, uh, open up more opportunities for the, the public to see this. They're also, um, currently planning on a signboard. So if you ride the Badger state trail, there's kind of the Fitchburg agricultural route. Um, there are a few signs on there with, uh, information about um, kind of the current situation and, and, and sort of historical information about locations along this Fitchburg agricultural route. A similar type of sign information board is planned for the O'Brien fields as well. And that'll right. be near the intersection of the Badger State Trail and Seminole Highway. So they're definitely, uh, there has been uh, certainly a push from Fitchburg's Common Council to be really uh, active about uh, outreach and education pertaining to this project and uh, everything I've seen from mg &E is they're on board with that as well. So hopefully we'll have um, more information on that sooner. Sounds good. Thank you. Great, Phil. Thank you. Uh, hopefully that uh, the bicycle tour will be like an annual event. We were on vacation this year, so I really d was disappointed that I missed that. So hopefully we'll, have we'll see them we'll again. Yeah, it, it should be easier every time after this. So hopefully uh, it's pretty simple to put together next year and we'll we'll get your schedule way in advance, Ron. Right. Make sure it works for you. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, just one more item on the agenda, 7D. I added this uh, and now I'm more I think about it, it's probably something that would be under old business. It's just activities being conducted or monitored by the commissioners that, that we're, we've been doing. And I thought something like the cafeteria recycling program, things like that, that where we could get updates on, on what's going on there. But I, I think that's, that would that be part of the old business? I, I, I'm just new to this, so I'm trying to figure out how we can make sure we stay updated on things that the commissioners are working on specifically. Yeah, I mean, I think I we could. I can't remember if we had that under old business or not. Yeah, so, so the recycling uh, update specifically, that was something that we had put under old business. Okay. Um, so, so for that specifically, we could put that there, or if you wanted to have this kind of just as an open discussion where folks come with other things, um, we could keep it on the agenda, or if folks want like a 10 minute time slot, then they would reach out to you directly to, to get an agenda item. Yeah, it's at the end of the meeting, and usually we're crunched at the very end to get things done. So it doesn't <laughs> offer much time for discussion. So I just assume keep it as part of the old business. Okay. It's usually, yeah, I can, Ron, I, I'd like have to a, look back, but it's usually before council update. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which would be That's old right. business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did yeah, you have something, Chris? We at least had that time allotted for in our schedule instead of, you know, getting it pinched out. 
Although if uh, I could give a one minute update on the school recycling. Yeah, we um, got three school. minutes, so. <laughs> All right, well, I'll try to go quick. Um, so uh, the food and nutrition director for Madison School District, uh, Steve Youngbauer has retired and there are two new people. And then um, there's also a new chief operations officer for uh, the Madison School District. Uh, I had a meeting with them last week and they are on board and want to continue to progress our waste reduction and recycling program within the Madison schools and support the things that we've done at uh, all the Leopold school. And so that is a kind of a developing area. There's going to be monthly meetings going on uh, with that, those new personnel within MMSD and hoping that, um, you know, this can kind of take the steps that we've envisioned all along uh, between, uh, well, Kim and, and uh, Diane, and myself have been involved the longest, but we've always wanted kind of our work at Aldo Leopold to spread to other schools in the district. And it's seeming more and more like a possibility that uh, we will have the support from MSD to make some of those things happen. Great. Do you want to talk about the tree diversity event? Yeah, Chris, can you cover that real quick? Sure, we had the tree diversity event last Thursday. Uh, it was a great success. Uh, several Fitchburg businesses uh, were very generous with their donations, uh, including the Home Depot, Young Garden Center, uh, K&A Greenhouses, and Fitchburg Farms. Uh, they all were very generous, and I think the uh, attendees all enjoyed uh, our speaker, Jay Weiss from Cambridge. He was very knowledgeable on trees and I certainly learned a lot at the event, uh, asked a lot of questions and Quarry Hill Park uh, will have labels on it in the near future. Uh, so you can go out and educate yourself uh, in the near future. Yeah, I was well there. Attended. Go ahead. It was, it was well attended, at least I thought it was. Yeah, I thought it was a, a great event. I actually learned a lot on that on that as well. I related back to my wife what uh, what happened and she, she said, well, is that all they're concerned about is just tree colors? In the fall time, <laughs> <laughs> I said no. There were some other things. I just, <laughs> but I thought it was a good event in introducing us to all the different trees. It'd be kind of nice to know if that program is at, at all the other parks are like that as well. I, I, you know, I think that that program needs more publicity. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was considering. In fact, I'm going to c contact the tree um, advisory committee, whoever the chair is, and see if they want to publicize that by writing an article in the star. Mm -hmm. That would be a good article. Okay. Do we have anything else from the commissioners? If not, I'd like to go ahead and adjourn the meeting at nine o'clock. Good job. All right. Thank you everyone for, uh, bearing with me today is first time I've been in the, in the chambers and also with people in front of me watching me <laughs> <laughs> not used to being out in the, since COVID being out with a bunch of people so <laughs> you did great thank you all right thank you the meeting's adjourned Thanks. bye, bye.